Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. We are uh, discussing H87 uh, regarding um, criminal code reclassification. And, uh, and then also later today, we will be discussing our recommendations uh, to the Appropriations Committee for the um, FY 2022 budget. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Martin Lalonde uh, for H87, uh, and we also have um, Council Eric Fitzpatrick here. So, Martin, go ahead. Great. Thank you. And, and <clears throat> I think we'll start where we left off, which was walking through the bill uh, and, and looking at each of the offenses that are involved uh, in the bill with a kind of a brief explanation of what the offense is about and what we're doing as far as the penalty, uh, what this bill is doing as far as the penalty. So I'll turn that over to Eric. I don't know if you wanna, you, you shared your screen, I think last time that probably makes some sense uh, again to do it that way, Eric, I would ima imagine. Yes, that definitely makes sense. Thank you, Representative Lalon. So Evan, if you could make me a co-host, which you did immediately, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to pick up uh, on the uh, explanation I was doing, I think it was uh, last week regarding H87 and in particular going through all the property offenses and indicating sort of some discussion where it wasn't obvious what the offense was, but also uh, more on point what the, how the penalty would change compared to current law versus the proposal in H87 and the classification system for, for crimes that's set up. So uh, what I'll do then is try and pick up. I think we got about two thirds of the way through. We, we, we did quite a bit. Um, so I will uh, pull up those documents again so that and try and pick up where we left off at that time. Let's see here. So here you may recognize the chart. This is the chart we were looking at last time. This shows the, the offense in the far left-hand column, uh, the statutory citation, the next one over. Then you have the third column over, I'm moving left to right. <clears throat> Excuse me, the third column over is the existing penalty. And then the last column is the, uh, the proposed penalty under H87. So that gives you, you know, a comparison right there between current, the penalty in current law and the penalty as it would be uh, under H87 for each particular property offense that's covered. So uh, you'll see the other document here, you may recall is the bill itself, H87, but I put some edits in. This is a version that sort of highlights what the substantive pieces of the offenses are, as well as uh, puts in some editorial content where it's helpful to help folks understand uh, what the, the nature of the offense really is. Um, so we'll pick up uh, right actually just above here a little bit. The, the first one that interestingly is a sort of a bit out of order in terms of the chart, but we had gone through um, all these leasing offenses, false claim, et cetera. And we got to uh, right up to here, which is uh, interestingly uh, known as timber trespass. It's a very unique and particular offense having to do with actually uh, uh, cutting down or destroying or removing timber or forest products, very particular trespass offense involving trees, forest products, that sort of thing. Um, and if we go over to the chart, you'll see that timber trespass, as it's referred to, is right down at the bottom of that column. There's uh, the existing penalties. It depends on whether it's a first offense or a second offense, but the penalties are fairly, fairly steep. It's a one-year misdemeanor, $20,000 fine for a first offense and a two-year misdemeanor $50,000 fine for a second offense. So you see, if you go continue over, the this is one of those offenses where the proposal from H87 does not follow the, the, uh, the tiered system. The, the proposal is not to go with this uh, level levelization tiered system that we've talked about. It's to assign them particular penalties. And for the timber offense, uh, sorry, timber trespass first offense, if the proposal is a class B misdemeanor which is a one-year imprisonment, $5,000 penalty. So I think given the particular nature of these offenses, uh, the proposal is to keep the penalties uh, consistent with existing law. So you see existing law for that one, it's a one-year misdemeanor, and the proposal is a one-year misdemeanor as well. Uh, much much uh, 
reduced fine from $20,000 to $5,000. And it's the same with the second offense. The second offense is a two-year misdemeanor. Same thing in the proposal, two-year misdemeanor, but it also drops the, uh, the fine from $50,000 to $10,000. Eric? So, yeah. Oh, uh, um, are you done with your timber trump trespass? Yeah, I was. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, and I get. I don't know if this is going to be a, if it's going to come out as a question or a statement, but it'll be for either you or or a Martin or both. But but a timber trespass really isn't that unusual. Um, I mean, I've heard of it of a number of times through the years, and. Um, and it can it can relate to thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, um, you know, that somebody may take from somebody's land and timber before they get caught. But um, is with something like that, uh, or any crime? But would there be restitution in that? And it would be, I think, it would be pretty complicated to figure out restitution if there was, because. In, in most cases, or a lot of cases, the, the lumber is gone and mixed in with, say, the, the plot next door that was a, a legal plot. So I guess in, in, uh, in wrapping up my question slash statement, I, I, I was just looking at, uh, to me anyway, the, the, uh, the penalties seemed really, really low compared to what... Um, the dollar amounts of what could be taken. So that's it. Yeah, well, to your to your first uh, question, Representative Burdett, yes, there would definitely be restitution involved in a case like this. You know, the out-of-pocket expenses uh, would be coverable under under the person who was the victim, in other words, the property owner in this case. Right, yeah. But uh, you, you make a good point. It, it might be hard to, to value the, the, the amount of the loss in a situation like that, if it were hard to track down the, the timber that was stolen or if it was already commingled with something else. But, but uh, the difficulty in valuation uh, piece aside for a second, restitution would apply for sure. It, and and I, I kind of guessed that, but, and maybe Martin could touch on um, why these uh, uh, penalties Well, the penalty that we have uh, that would be imposed through this um, categorization system is essentially the same as it is uh, under current law, except except for the uh, at least the uh, incarceration is. Let me look at what uh, the yes the the uh, fine is definitely less uh, for for this particular uh, offense. Uh, a class A misdemeanor carries a $10,000 fine, not a $50,000 fine. I think the critical point with, with that and with all fines is, is there really are two critical points as far as, as, far as I understand it. Uh, one is that courts, and we heard from, you know, the, the Sentencing Commission heard this, and uh, I don't know if we've heard the testimony this year or if it was last year, but uh, courts simply really do not focus as much on the monetary penalty for, for most of these property laws. Uh, you know, there's, that's certainly part of it, but my understanding has been, and, and this is something that I think really was confirmed by the testimony of, uh, of Chris Fenno on Tuesday, I guess that was, is restitution is the, is the more important uh, point as far as a property crime. Uh, rather than uh, a stiff penalty, monetary penalty, which goes to the state, uh, the idea is to focus on the restitution so that the individual who's actually harmed uh, is, is kind of first in line for receiving whatever uh, money there may be available. At least that's been my understanding. That's something we can certainly ask uh, Pepper as well when he comes in. Uh, so, Yeah, that, that kind of went through my mind too, that maybe... Uh... It's to make it easier for restitution. Um, but with, with that said, uh, I, I know there's a lot more study that went into it than me just looking at it saying that's too low. <laughs> but um, but yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, and I know that Ken had a question as well. So I'm going to go completely the other way from what Tom's saying. If I've got 
one tree that's cut on somebody else's land uh, that just was a mistake that they thought was on my property, I could get hit with this fine and this all this stuff? Or anybody could? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll let, maybe Eric understood it. I'm logging, let me, let me make it very simple. I'm logging my property, which I'm about to do. I think the tree's on my land. It's not. One tree gets cut. I could have this thrown at me? No. Uh, th th this requires knowingly or knowingly or recklessly mindset. I'm looking at the language on time, line 12. So anything that's accidental or even negligent would not be criminalized. It has to be knowingly. You know that the, that the tree is on the other person's land, but you cut it anyway. Or recklessly, generally the definition of recklessly is also conscious disregard of a known risk. So you know that it's likely that it's on the other person's land, but you cut it anyway. If it's a, if it's a garden variety, lack of reasonable care, mistake, uh, accidental, it wouldn't be covered. So I'm talking, I'm talking, Eric, uh, mainly boundary lines. You're not 100% sure you think you're within 50 feet of, you know, one way or the other, right, on this one tree. You're saying that that would be, that would fall under, uh, what'd you say, accidental? Yes. So I don't think that would be covered. If you're talking about an honest mistake, uh, you know, uh, just a, just a, you, you, you mis, mis, uh, misunderstood where the boundary was, no, uh, that, to me, that would not, not rise to the level of recklessness. Okay. So would, would there still be, there'd probably still be restitution because I mean, if you get a, you know, a, a 36 inch uh, uh, in diameter uh, oak log that's, that's 50 or 60 feet long, the thing's probably gonna be worth quite a few thousand dollars. Uh, so there would probably still have to be restitution or pay them for for their, for their uh, log, I would have to say. That, that probably gets away from whether that's a criminal charge. Right, right, no, no. But civil, I, some sort of a civil damage claim. So I think that's kind of getting a little ways away from this bill. <laughs> uh, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, Bob had a question. Yeah, uh, looking under the criminal penalty itself, uh, having been somewhat exposed to this, is there a, a number attached to this? Is this just one tree or is this someone comes and takes out a, a load of logs or what's this first offense, second offense? How do you, how do you come up with a, I don't, I don't know the penalty here, but the restitution is what I'm concerned about. I know the old rule of thumb was it used to be, if in fact this, this did happen, you'd, you'd go out and identify the tree, measure the stump and the value of restitution would be three times the stump value. That's the old rule of thumb, but. So how many trees can you cut down? Uh, can, can you take out a load of trees here, just one tree before you get this first defense or where, where does that come into play? And I realize we're not talking about changing the elements of this trespass criminal penalty here. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't know if Eric knows. I think it's, if you look at line 13 and 14, it's any timber or forest product. So I think even one tree could conceivably uh, um, make it a criminal violation if you were doing it knowingly. You know, if, if you knowingly did it, then one tree could constitute a violation. Uh, by a second offense, I, I know it's generally viewed as like if, if you were to say you cut down three trees at the same time, yep. that wouldn't be viewed as a separate offense generally. That's part of the same common, a common nucleus of, of facts, the same activity. You know, kind of it may remind people of the of the uh, remember the particular statute that was passed for the organized retail theft because people were doing things separately. And that, that's because if they're, if, you know, they're all done at once, it's one offense. On the other hand, if it was done as separate events, uh, then, it might, then it would be a, second, a subsequent offense. But, uh, you know, one, one uh, event, you know, one trespass onto the other person's property in which you cut down three trees, I would read that as a, as a single offense. Whereas if you cut down one tree, you know, one day and went back a few days later and cut down the second one, that seems more like a, a second offense. So one instance where he goes and cuts down a, a log load of timber, takes it out of there, it's, it's a one, first offense and a $5,000 fine. I didn't understand, I didn't follow that, sorry. You were talking about one versus three trees. 
I was talking about, and you said this one offense there, and I said, okay, but so if someone goes in and takes out a log load of trees, is that still a first offense and five thousand dollar fine? Yes. Okay. Hopefully, the restitution to... goes further than that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, restitution is generally they try to have it as the value of the property taken. So, as far as the value of, of a tree goes, there's I don't remember the name of the national organization. It's an arborist organization. There's actually a formula that you can use, uh, you know, with uh, uh, percentages and whatever. I used to know it. Uh, and to determine the value of a tree and, and part of the, the equation is if it's in the woods or in somebody's front yard, because if you, if you took like a, if somebody had a 36 inch, say a beautiful maple tree in their front yard and uh, you know, and somebody came and cut it down with that formula, this day and age, that tree is going to be worth tens of thousands of dollars, but you take the same tree in the middle of the woods where it hasn't got a log on it and it's only got fire firewood value, it, it might be worth, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars, the same exact tree. Shall we get out of the forest and move on? <laughs> <laughs> it, out of the weeds and into the woods. <laughs> well, that brings us to unlawful mischief, out of the woods, into the Unlawful mischief general. And this is just uh, this is your your standard property damage criminal statute. So if somebody, this is what's the, the is usually used for general uh, offense that involves just damaging someone else's property. You know, you you uh, uh, use a use a sledgehammer to pound in somebody's car doors or something like that, or you knock over their mailboxes, or you cut, uh, you know do something to damage their property. That this unlawful mischief statute is typically what's used. And as you would imagine in a situation like that, it varies depending on how much property is damaged. So uh, if you, your standard, I'm looking right above the the unlawful, uh, the timber trespass statute that we just looked at on the chart, skip over the explosive one for a moment. Uh, your garden variety, the next one up is your garden variety unlawful mischief. Uh, and that would generally be up to $250 uh, in property damage. So that's your, your lowest level one under existing law. So if you do um, $250 or less of property damage, it's a six month misdemeanor. You see that third column over or a $500 fine. The proposal from H87 is to follow the tiered proposal in this case. So for unlawful mischief, you see that for all the unlawful mischief, mischief offenses, the proposal is going to be to go with the tiered system. And that means uh, in some cases it would be lower. In some cases it might be equal. For example, under that tiered system, remember, if it's less than $100 worth of damage, then it's a 30-day offense, 30-day uh, misdemeanor. So as you can see, if that were the case, that would be a, a lesser penalty than under existing law, which always has a six-month misdemeanor for anything less than $250. Uh, uh, um, the next category up in the tier is um, between $100 and, and $1,000, basically, of property damage. And if that's the case, then it's a six-month misdemeanor. So you see, in some of those cases, the uh, six months period would be the same. Say you did $500 worth of proper damage. Well, if that were the case, then it would be a six month misdemeanor under current law and it would be under the tiered proposal as well. On the other hand, if you did $800 worth of property damage, um, then under the tiered proposal, that would uh, still be the six month misdemeanor, but under the un current unlawful mischief statute, you see that would be a one year misdemeanor because that bumps you up one level to between $250 and $1,000. So in general, the penalties for unlawful mischief are either gonna be the same or, or slightly less under the uh, tiered proposal. If you look at the, the very top one, it goes on to the next, just above it on the, on the page above, unlawful mischief more than $1,000. That one under current law is a felony. It's a five-year felony, $5,000 penalty. So under that one also is proposed by H87 to follow the tiered proposal. So if it was more than $1,000 uh, worth of property damage, then it would follow the tiered system, which again, that depends on it's more, there are more categories than just above $1,000. So between 1,000 and 3,000, it's a two year misdemeanor, which would be less than the existing uh, penalty. If it's between 3,000 and $100,000, 
uh, it's a three-year misdemeanor, also less than the five years. But if it's more than $100,000 worth of property damage, then it's a Class D felony. That's a five-year felony, same as the penalty uh, for unlawful mischief currently if the offense involves more than $1,000 worth of damage. So again, that sort of structure, generally speaking, um, for the amount of property damage you're doing results in either the same or a less severe penalty. So that's unlawful mischief. We just did uh, timber trespass as well. Now we're on to general trespass. I think everybody understands what that is, trespass on someone else's land. Um, the uh, This is a case where the uh, proposal uses, rather than the tiered system, it used some specific, uh, specific categories of penalty instead of following that um, tiered, tiered system. So you see for the first unlawful trespass offense, that's the very bottom of the page on top. And I should say that's a general, no, I didn't mean first offense, that's a general unlawful trespass to somebody else's property. The current uh, penalty for that is three months, $500. The uh, H87 proposes uh, 30 days, $500. That's a class D misdemeanor. So you see it goes from three months to 30 days, but the $500 fine is the same. You know, there's a couple other specific unlawful trespass offenses. You see one involves going into a building and another into a dwelling. Uh, the building offense is a one-year misdemeanor, and that is the same proposal in H87, one year. Uh, this one, it's because it makes it a Class B. The $500 fine in the um, current law is increased to $5,000 in the H87. And similar to unlawful trespass in a dwelling, again, it keeps the, the uh, penalty, the incarceration period, I should say, the same. Three years in existing law, it's a Class C felony, which also has three years. Uh, but the penalty, sorry, the fine is bumped up from 2000 to 15. You then, you then have a couple of interesting uh, property trespass related statutes that have been on the books for a long time, very particular. One of them involving un unauthorized book removal from a library, very specific. Also a, a unique penalty in that the, the, the uh, penalty for that is a, a fine of not more than $50. Half of it goes to the library and half of it covers prosecution costs. So that's highly unusual um, and has been on the books for quite a long time, as you might imagine. The proposal from H87 is to change that to a $250 fine only offense. So there'll be no, no incarceration, no, no jail time for unauthorized removal. Um, similar to opening a dam, also a very particular type of property offense. You open, open a dam and let the, let the dammed in water flow out. That's a five-year felony under existing, existing law. And H87 keeps that a five-year felony. It makes it a five, uh, uh, sorry, keeps it a five-year felony, but the fine goes from 500 to 25,000. Now the motor vehicle- Does, does Eric, anybody Eric, well, find, Go ahead, Ken. Opening a, a dam, is that an existing dam? What, what's, a, what's that mean? Does anybody find that odd? Yeah, you see the language yet. Yeah, it does have to apply to an existing dam. You have to willfully and maliciously injure, remove, or open a dam, reservoir, gate, or flume. Um, I didn't catch this at the very end. It also applies to a public, uh, a public or toll bridge. Didn't realize that. Um, so yeah, very specific. You're right, uh, Representative Gosselin. It's uh, um, one of those older statutes that that uh, has been been around for quite some time and probably the penalties itself uh, are also somewhat dated. I feel like I'm dated. <laughs> <laughs> was there another question there? Sorry, I could, can't see. Yeah, but, I, uh, think I, I think Tom did, but I was just wondering if Ken yeah. was missing about this. Yeah, I was wondering if Ken was done. I'm missing the boat. It it went in in my dam that got removed. I'm done. If, uh, I'll just jump in and add, I, I can easily think of a couple of small dams in in Rutland City 
uh, where it, if, uh, you know, it, they're older, they're earthen dams, it really wouldn't take that much to, to um, knock one out maliciously and it would potentially cause millions of dollars of damage. So, you know, I, I certainly think this is something that's worth keeping on the books. Yeah. So, so I, I understand that. I guess I was talking about smaller recreational dams or something like that, but I, I guess that's not what this applies to. Well, if, if, if I could just, just reply, you know, I, I can think of at least one dam that the city's looking at is whether it needs to be taken out or not because of the, you know, how it's affecting the, the water, the water that flows out of the dam and through the city. And that is small. That was built recreationally um, to, build a, to build a pond in a neighborhood that was being developed in the 1950s. But at this point, because so much has been built up down underneath it, there's so many homes that weren't there before that if, if that dam were to be, were to be taken out, uh, you know, it, it would, the, the flow of water and silt and whatnot would be um, high dollar damage. So, you know, I, I think that even like small recreational dams that are just um, creating a neighborhood pond, depending on what's downstream, uh, the effects could be uh, very negative for a community. Yeah, I, I'm all set on my, my question all from, right, the, from the chat. All right, moving ahead to obstruction then, uh, Eric. Yeah, this one is, uh, um, Basically, it's almost trespassing with a vehicle, uh, essentially, that's the idea, or, or obstructing, both are covered. So if without the permission of the owner, you use a motor vehicle to either obstruct a private driveway, uh, byway or gateway, or travel on a private road that's marked private or other private lands, or interestingly, number three, enter on private lands for the purpose of camping. So you camp on somebody else's property using a car, obviously, is the whole idea here. Um, so that... Uh, under existing law, you see, is a $500 fine. Uh, the proposal under the H87, uh, you'll see motor vehicle trespass is essentially what that is. Uh, also keeps it a fine only offense, so there's no, no jail time. And it goes from $500 to $250. Uh, this is, you see, the exact same situation happens in the next two offenses, uh, operating a vehicle on state-owned land. Now, that means it's not just, again, it's not a, a non-knowing situation. The land has to be posted uh, by the state uh, and it has to be contrary to the rules uh, of, that are governing the land that the state has. And if you do uh, still in violation of the rules and the sign, operate the vehicle on the state-owned land, it's a $500 fine. Same thing if you do it causing damage, uh, 3940. And both of those take the same approach under uh, H87 that we just talked about, the $500 fine. It still maintains it as a fine only penalty, but it goes to $250. And I'll just make a quick comment on some of the continuing work of the Sentencing Commission uh, is to look at various fine only offenses and decide whether they should uh, become civil offenses instead of, uh, as they currently are, uh, criminal offenses, including the unauthorized removal of books from the library, the ones we just talked about here. But that's some further consideration that we may be seeing a recommendation from them down the road. So we may be revisiting these someday. So back to you, Eric. Sure. So you'll see the next three offenses are all similar in the sense that they're related to property, property offenses involving cemeteries and, and graveyards. Uh, you see, the first one is, is the most serious. It's the unauthorized removal of human remains. It's pretty self-evident what that is. That is a serious offense. It's a 15-year felony for uh, it's basically stealing human remains from a cemetery. Um, and under the proposal from H87, it keeps it a serious offense. It's a slightly less. It's a 10-year felony instead of a 15-year felony. And the, if I'm reading it right, I believe the fine is increased from 10000 to 50000 that's the proposal. Uh, there's also a five-year, I'm on the next one down now, stealing or removing grave markers, headstones, cemetery markers. And that's also a felony. If you do that, that's a five-year felony, a $5,000 fine. Uh, the proposal from H87 keeps it a five-year felony. The fine increases to 25K, uh, but the, the penalty, sorry, the incarceration is the same. And similar with, with uh, stealing, removing flowers and plants at a graveyard, you'll see also 
is a, a specific offense. That was a one year misdemeanor with a $500 fine. And the one year misdemeanor is maintained in H87, which proposes the, the class put in the, the category of class B misdemeanor, which has, uh, as I said, a one year misdemeanor along with a $5,000 fine. This next one is disturbing a funeral that's uh, having a protest within a certain within a certain uh, uh, distance from a funeral while the funeral is going on. Uh, that's a specific offense. That's a 30 day misdemeanor under existing law with a $500 fine. You'll see that that um, is maintained in the proposal. It also, it's a mix of class D misdemeanor, which has uh, the exact same penalties, 30 days, $500. Now you'll see also a similar theme in the next full five offenses or so. You see they all involve uh, essentially uh, some sort of interference with utility property. So again, these are very specific types. Each one's a different type of utility. And you can just go through them very quickly. You see the first one is tapping a gas pipeline. So you tap into a gas pipeline illegally that obviously belongs to uh, somebody else. Um, the second one, tapping electric lines. Next one, interfering with a utility meter, injuring lights. Those are pub, you know, lights, uh, uh, not, not just belonging to some on someone else's house, but rather electric company lights, power company. And lastly, tapping unauthorized tapping of uh, cable TV wires. So these all have very specific penalties. Now go back to the top one again. The, the tapping gas one uh, goes from one year a one year misdemeanor to a two year misdemeanor under the proposal. Electric lines stays at two years, two-year misdemeanor under existing law and under the proposal. The interfering with the utility meter is a three-month misdemeanor under existing law, and that goes down to a 30-day misdemeanor in the proposal. The lights, injuring lights goes from three months to 30 days also, just like the utility meter one did. And lastly, the unauthorized tapping of a cable television wire is a fine only penalty of $100, and that is also maintained as a fine on the penalty, the maximum of 250 in the proposal. So, so Eric, um, yeah. I think going back to the tapping the gas uh, pipes with intent to defraud, that to be consistent with what the current penalty is, it should be a class B misdemeanor, I believe. I think that somehow that was overlooked because it suggests in the document that we got from the sentencing commission that uh, that it was the same, that it should be a class A misdemeanor, but that class A is a two year misdemeanor, class B is a one year misdemeanor. The current penalty is one year. So I do believe we need to probably change that to a class B misdemeanor. So I'm going to flag that. Yep, yep. I see. I was just going back to the language to, to double check that, that I didn't make a, that it wasn't a typo on my part uh, between what the, the proposed bill says. But yeah, you're right. So it does say, it does have class A misdemeanor in the proposal. Um, so so class that, B, right? Yeah, it should be class B. And, and, and actually it's somehow, that, that was in the recommendation. And I think that was just an oversight uh, with the Sentencing Commission uh, recommendation. Mark, oh, okay. Martin? Yes, Barbara. This Barbara, I cannot believe it is not a fine to interfere with maple tapping in our state. <laughs> Seriously. Well, we- But I'm we, proposing a new crime, but I was surprised. Can't we just change the terms gas to maple syrup for, uh, in this particular crime, uh, Eric? I'm at, it's you. the same thing. <laughs> it is kind of the same thing, right? <laughs> so it's it's the fuel that runs the state, so we can make an argument that it's already covered, uh, Barbara. All right, sorry, Eric. <laughs> Moving ahead. No, I was just I was jotting. That sounds like a proposal for a me the Maple Amendment, correct? <laughs> <laughs> can I just say something, please, you guys? Uh, this Maple thing, you know what's way more expensive is the birch syrup now that's coming on big time. Uh, well, but can that really be qualified as uh, the gas that runs the state? I don't know, Ken. I'm just telling you. 
All right, future reference. Hey, can we get out of the trees? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the trees again. Let's move on to the utility meters. Yeah, I'd like to get out of the trees and into the right of way for a second, if I could. Um, the the uh, uh, the list of crimes they had up there, Eric, I, and I'm, maybe it's somewhere else that I didn't see or probably covered somewhere else. Uh, we got tapping pipelines and gas lines or, or uh, electric lines and that type of thing. Is there a, somewhere else as far as damaging electric lines? And what's going through my mind, and again, I'm going back to my 24 years in the tree business, that uh, people... I don't understand why, but there's actually people that will go out on a transmission line with 345,000 volts going through them and they'll shoot at the lines and put holes in the lines. I mean, the lines are as big as your wrist. I mean, they're huge, but um, I didn't know if, uh, I got to believe it's covered somewhere. It's, it would be covered in unlawful mischief for certain, uh, I would say, uh, it, it perhaps elsewhere. Uh, Eric, where, where else do you think that that might be covered? We still have Eric. Yeah, I think I, I didn't quite hear that last last comment. Sorry. Well, I was just saying that that would probably be unlawful mischief. Yeah. So right, exactly right. What What are the penalties uh, there? If, if anybody knows off the top of their head. No, it's right here. Unlawful mischief. Uh, yeah, depend, although, did you say, Representative Burdett, was it was it blocking someone's right of way? It no, no, no. I no. I, I said out of the woods and into the right of way because I was talking about uh, electric line right of ways. And uh, but people like the big transmission lines. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they're bigger now. But back when I was in the business, there were three hundred and forty-five thousand volts going through those things, and people used to shoot at them. Uh, they're too big to, you know, to break basically, but certainly to damage and weaken. And uh, so I was just wondering where, what, what uh, crime uh, would cover that. And I was suggesting unlawful mischief right. <clears throat> and it would depend on the value of the damage. Uh, so if it was over a hundred thousand dollars in damage, that would be a, a five-year felony. Uh, but that's, that's that tiered uh, value of, of the damage. That, that we have in here. Was, was that over, over 100,000 or over 25,000? No, it's over $100,000. Uh, you can see it at the, if, uh, it's on page five of the bill that it says uh, for value of $100, it's a class D misdemeanor, or I should say less than $100, a class D misdemeanor. Uh, uh, 100 to $1,000 is a class C misdemeanor. Uh, one thousand to three thousand dollars is a class A misdemeanor. Three thousand to hundred thousand dollars is a class E felony, which is three years. Uh, and if it's over hundred thousand dollars, it's a class D felony, which is a five-year felony. Gotcha. Okay. No, that provides the restitution component as well that we've talked about. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think that. Uh, it's sort of a wordy statute here, 3782, although it's called tapping electric lines, injuries to electric plants. I think that also could conceivably apply, I think, given the language at the very first part of the sentence, person who willfully commits or causes to commit, be committed an act with intent to injure a machine, apparatus, or structure appertaining to the works of et cetera, et cetera, engaged in manufacturing, selling, or distributing electrical energy. Right. So. That could that could be encompassed by that same conduct you were describing, Eric. This doesn't say if the damage is caused while they were trying to steal the power, basically. No, I don't think. I, I, well, I don't know. That's, I think I mean, that's, says, that's just me. But <laughs> no, you might be right on line eight. You mean or whereby such works. Well, yeah, I mean, at the beginning, it, it talks about intent to injure machine apparatus or structure, but then it says appertaining to the works of a person, firm, association, or corporation engaged in manufacturing, selling, or distributing the energy. 
Yeah, I think that means damaging any any apparatus by appertaining is sort of connected to uh, you know any company or person that's selling energy, electric electricity. Yeah, but does that encompass just the vandal out there shooting the lines, though? I think so. Okay. Well, but, you know, it's an old statute, and I don't know for sure, but and, and that language is uh, not how I would write it right now. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but, but, but it seems like it certainly could. Okay. Yeah. Moving on to, are we all set to move on? Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I'm still. I'm still a little uh, puzzled about that, and, and I don't. I mean, I'm. I'm just a layperson, but that's not the way I see that. And I didn't know if maybe there's just a small word change that we could make to definitely encompass somebody who's out there vandalizing, or if even that's the place to do it. I mean, my, my or, or, or are we are we covering enough someplace else? Yeah, I mean, my view, and we could ask uh, Pepper uh, this, is that on that one, uh, we're covered better under unlawful mischief, which would cover the behavior you're talking about, because this one um, does not really take into account the the uh, value of the damage, whereas mis the unlawful mischief does. And, and the way that the Sentencing Commission looked at this, and the reason they didn't use the tiered value is they really focused on the the tapping of the electricity, you know, because that's part of this provision, not yep. the po potential damage, because the comment the Sentencing Commission made with respect to this one was it would be hard to measure the value of whatever electricity may have been tapped. So therefore, just keep it as a straight class A misdemeanor. That was the rationale for why they uh, recommended this route. Uh, I don't know how, I don't recall how much they looked at the damage component of it, or if they just figured that would be sufficiently covered under the unlawful mischief. And I, I'm sure it would be just thinking out loud, I guess, but yeah. Uh, Martin, all right. Thank you. Martin. Martin. Yeah. Uh, yes. Coach. Um, you know, in our earlier discussions that we had uh, with the prosecutors, uh, being the state's attorneys, um, it would seem that uh, a lot of this would fall under prosecutorial discretion uh, as far as depending on who the arresting agency, you know, was and the charges they brought forward. Uh, because in the case that um, Tom was talking about, if I happen to have been a game warden, and I came upon, you know, someone um, unlawfully, you know, shooting at, you know, private property. Uh, it would be up to me to, you know, determine, you know, how I would bring that, you know, assailant back to uh, be charged and then the prosecutor would make the final decision as to the charges he or she was going to bring forward you know so uh, it's i i don't think anybody's going to get away with uh that level of mis mischief i would think uh, probably not all right let's interfere with some meters I think we've already gone through all these oh, okay. all right. utility cool. offenses, um, and we were getting to uh, um, another specific offense having to do with cutting ice and not fencing the hole. Very Vermont specific offense. So you uh, take ice from water over which people are accustomed to pass, don't place around the opening. Uh, any sort of suitable guard to, to prevent a person from falling in, that under existing law is a $50 fine. And under the proposal, it becomes a class E misdemeanor, which you'll see is a, uh, where are we here? Yes, $250 fine. See, that's the second to last one from the bottom. Uh, existing law, not more than $50. The proposal from H87 makes it a, 
Class C misdemeanor. Again, a fine only penalty, no incarceration, $250. Very similar uh, to the structure, actually exactly from almost identical to the provisions for removing a survey marker. So if you, if you uh, remove a survey marker from property, currently it's a not more than a $100 fine. The proposal is to make it a, also a Class C misdemeanor uh, like the previous couple of offenses, but those have a $250 maximum fine, but it is fine only. So there's no... Uh, no How old uh, is that unfenced holiday ice? Because I'm guessing it goes back to the days when there was ice companies yeah. You know, cutting the ice in the winter time, um, which I, I, to me, the potential not. I mean, now I, I, I'm guessing it would probably pertain more to an ice fisherman than it would an ice company, I guess. But uh, the potential of um, injury is certainly incredibly high compared to removing a survey marker, but. <laughs> yeah, I just pulled it up on the on the online statutes. It doesn't actually give a date as to when it was enacted. So uh, I, I don't think pens, the, pens uh, and pencils probably weren't invented yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so in the green books, it looks like originally 1872, but it appears that something happened in 1947. Yeah, um, they invented the refrigerator. Maybe they raised it to $50 in 1947, but 1872 right. is when it was. Actually, all, all the statutes were, were recodified in 47. That's oh. when there was a, a, a huh. codification of the Green Books. Huh. So what have you were involved in that, were you, Eric? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Sorry. I, I was close. I think I was still in law school. <laughs> Getting a little punchy here. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> all right. <laughs> before we lose everybody uh, right, right. On. so we're moving on we're very close to the end here we, we see that we've got uh, just a bunch of the, the computer fraud offenses are all here on uh uh the same same grouping you see them and they also under existing law they depend again how much property you you've obtained through the use of computer fraud uh you know for five hundred dollars or less it's a one-year misdemeanor um Second offense is a two-year misdemeanor, five hundred dollars or less. More than five hundred dollars, ten-year misdemeanor. Uh, and then you see there's a there's a specific offense for for actually altering or damaging a computer network. That also depends on how much uh, damage you've actually done. If it's uh, one year, or sorry, if it's five hundred dollars or less, it's one year. Five hundred dollars or more, or sorry, or less. Second offense, two years. If they've been more than five hundred dollars, it's a ten-year felony. For damaging a computer network, and in all of these cases, all of these computer offenses, you see all over in the far right column, the proposal is to follow the tiered proposal. So in each case, uh, you'll you'll swap the offense based on how much property was damaged with the computer fraud or the altering the computer network. That will slot into one of the tiered categories. So if it's less than hundred dollars, it's a thirty day misdemeanor. Uh, $100 to $999, six-month misdemeanor, uh, between um, 1,000 and 3,000, class A misdemeanor, two-year penalty, uh, two penalty. And then if it's between $3,000 and $100,000, then it kicks into a felony category, three-year felony, five-year felony if it's more than $100,000. So uh, with all of those computer offenses, the proposal is to use that tiered structure. So Eric, the... Um... Uh, the case at UVM uh, with the medical records uh, and the breach to uh, that security system, that would be at the top of the tier then? Yeah, in terms of the amount of damage done? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That would be in the, the top tier for sure. Yeah, okay. Yep. So, uh, Eric, uh, there's one... Uh, crime that you jumped over that I noticed is not in the chart, I don't think, and that's the unlawful taking of tangible personal property, huh. uh, which, which you probably will see in your other, your other document. It's just a, it's in between the ice and the uh, survey, surveying monuments, but I don't think it's, uh, 
actually on the it's yeah. in the bill it's in the bill though yeah um oh yeah that it did not it didn't make it to the chart sorry about that yeah no no that's that it wasn't in the chart for some reason from the sentencing commission either so oh um but committing you know that that it's just a, a fine we're, we're being consistent with the, the saying that it's a class e interestingly enough uh selena has a question just what is that like how is that different <laughs> from any other form of theft uh i believe i don't know what that is well eric are you familiar with that one are we talking about this tangible personal property yeah uh it is interesting that it's uh it, it appears to only apply on line 19 with the intent of depriving the owner temporarily right. of the lawful possession of the property. So I'm not sure what, what that means. In other words, it, so that's why it, obviously it wouldn't be a theft because a theft is you're taking it permanently to, be, to your own possession. But this seems to be you take it away or carry it away any tangible personal property only with the intent of depriving the owner temporarily of possession. So I'm not maybe maybe say you you take somebody's car out for a joyride, but you you intend to bring it back. Mm -hmm. That's off the top of my head. I, I really don't know. Yeah, it's like borrowing <laughs> without permission. Right. No, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> okay. That's, that's, probably a, that's probably a kind way of putting it. <laughs> so I, 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 that one. Barbara, did you have a question, or is that from before? It's from before. Sorry. I'm sorry, Coach. Did you have a? Did you have something? Uh, else? Uh, yeah, a question. So you would think maybe some of that might have to do with internet uh, related types of, um, you know, of, of crimes. Um, if someone was uh, using your network um, uh, and, you know, not necessarily profiting, you know, but using it for ill, you know, like... Uh, you know, let's say, uh, um, you know, the computer sex crimes or something like that. And, you know, <clears throat> I wonder if, if, if those kinds of things would, uh, would categorize, because, you know, that's, that's why you have to have such a high level of security on even on your home, uh, because some of those new routers can pick up uh, from a pretty great distance. Right, right. Could be. Yeah, that could fit too. Yeah. Okay. All right. So where are we? As far we're on our last our last group of offenses. We're on the last page now. Uh, I think it's the last page. Let me double. Sorry, me. Uh, yes. So now we're down to yes. So here we are. Our last few. And actually, uh, no, we're not there. We've already done them. It was just a, 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 another series of offenses based on. Uh, the amount of property involved in the in the theft of the computer network. So we are, we already went over it. Actually, there were just an, another structure of existing penalties for for second offense, subsequent offense, um, etc. And in each case, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the um, the tiered proposal was followed, except for the unauthorized access to a computer network. I see that's the one situation where uh, the proposal is not to follow the tier proposal, but to make it a six month misdemeanor, which is the same as existing law. But let's see what that is. Unauthorized accessing of a computer network. And I think that likely is similar to what, uh, yeah, here we are. Knowingly and intentionally without lawful authority accessing any computer computer system. This is what you were talking about, uh, coach, I think very similar. Um, you know, accessing someone else's computer system, computer network, um, is a class D misdemeanor, which let's double check on that again. I think it's six months, correct? Yeah, six months misdemeanor under existing law and under the proposal. All righty. Um, but that brings us to the end, yeah? So any other questions at the moment for Eric? I know that there are at least three changes I see, and I've, of course, uh, I will ask a little later when we get through this, what else people want to, uh, or who else people want to hear from, but why don't we jump to uh, 
Rob and Joy to, to go over the documents that uh, she sent us last week, if we could do that. And um, should I stop well, sharing the, these documents? Yeah, yeah, if you could stop sharing that. And I'm wondering, uh, well, Robin, I don't think you're in a position to share the screen, are you? Uh, you're on I the I am phone. not. Okay, do you think, um, I'm wondering if we should share the screen from here and you should describe it or if folks can actually access while talking? What's, what's your all preference? Because I could probably... Uh, I know that some of the um, Excel spreadsheets that I sent did not translate well to PDF. Um, so I think that the original um, Excel spreadsheets might be better to share on the screen. And, and sir, I, I sent those to you as well as Evan. Uh, th those were sent to the House Judiciary or just to Evan and to me? Yep, yep. Okay. All right. Well, let me... So while I'm looking for that... Why don't we have James Pepper jump on? And, and there's a, a couple questions I'd like to address to him. And, and if he has anything else to add just generally, but, uh, or, or Evan, if you could actually look for the email from, uh, from Robin, so maybe you can share the screen uh, of, of those documents. But in any event, so, so Pepper, the, um, I don't know if you've uh, listened in and all, but there, there were a couple possible changes that, that we were thinking that, that I was going to propose that we make. Uh, and I wanted to get your input on those. It, it's just a proposal at this point. Uh, folks haven't agreed or disagreed with it yet. But in particular, it's, it's on, I don't know if you have the document in front of you, but it's uh, page uh, 16 uh, of the bill as introduced. And it's section 18 and 19, uh, the uh, fraud or embezzlement, I should say, by an officer of a bank, or uh, that's uh, section 2532 of 13 BSA, or uh, receiver or trustee um, embezzlement from, by a receiver or trustee, which is 13 BSA 2533. And the, the, those laws, offenses as they are on the books right now are not associated with a particular value. Uh, and I think that's primarily because these are positions that are, uh, are positions of trust. And, and it's, it's even really the breaching of trust that leads these to being a, uh, I think current, under current law, 10 year uh, felonies. And I was gonna propose that instead of following the valuation tiers for property is to have those be uh, a class, uh, I guess class D felony, which is a five-year felony to be consistent kind of with, with the upper level of those tiers that we've established, but, but have that recognize that these are offenses that involve really more a breach of trust than what the underlying value is at least that's the way they are in the books currently. So I don't know if you have a viewpoint on that. Um, for the record, James Pepper from the Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, it, it, you're right. I mean, these are, they're almost akin, but not exactly to status offenses, where it's really the status of the actor that uh, is driving the enhancement um, here. And, you know, so these crimes do not fall neatly into the underlying logic of what the Sentencing Commission proposed, which was look at the amount of property, property damage or look at the harm that was caused and try to evaluate the appropriate tier, of course, adjusting downward um, for the actual going rate, but really look at the underlying damage done or property stolen. And just as, as you mentioned, you know, this is, these are somewhat different because, you know, if, if this was not uh, done by someone who's, you know, been put in, tr you know, in a position of trust, then you could just follow the tiered proposal and look at the amount of property stolen. But this is enhanced in our current statutes because of that breach of trust. So I'm, I think that it does deserve a different set of considerations when you're thinking about the tiered structure and not just about the the, the damage done um, you know I'm I, I think that you should be guided um, 
in evaluating whether it should be a class D or a class E by what the current going rate is for these types of embezzlement crimes based on kind of historical sentencing practices or, or more recent sentencing practices for these types of crimes. So that might be a question for Robin specifically on, on this, this subsection of crimes. Okay, well, I appreciate that. I, we can follow up with uh, Robin, although I think uh, jumping down from a 10 year to a three year might be a little more than folks would want to uh, do so, but we can look at yeah what the going rate is. That's what that's what's in us anyway. So, um, I had another question. Well, this is just pointing out that there was uh, we did a walk through of every single crime. We did uh, notice that there was one that uh, the recommendation from the sentencing commission was not accurate. Uh, this is a uh, tapping gas pipes with intent to defraud, which is currently a one year uh, misdemeanor. And the Sentencing Commission wanted it to be the same, but they said class A misdemeanor, which is two years. So uh, my proposal is we change that to a class B. I think that was just an oversight. I, I would agree. I was looking at it just as, you know, Eric was doing the walkthrough and it, se and it seems like that was a, a typo. And so yeah, I would so agree. There's one other one other thing I just wanted to hit on real quickly because it is something I that uh, I raised that are when we were going over this last week as far as far as counterfeiting paper money and we were just really kind of wondering if this is a crime that's really charged is this really should be a federal crime and uh, Robin Joy came back to me and said that it is actually a crime that has been charged and I, I don't know if you have any knowledge about that particular offense it happens to be on page nine of this right uh, draft um, so um i did I, I was watching the testimony on, on youtube and so i did catch you talking about that um it looks like counterfeiting money uh is really both the production or the trying to pass those counterfeited dollars um and so uh i looked uh in our case management software which has some historic data. Um, it looks like there were 91 cases uh, where counterfeiting, and it didn't separate uh, between either the produ production of the counterfeited uh, money or it was the trying to purchase using counterfeited money. Um, but there were 91 historic cases that I came across. Um, the most recent one I think was from 2020 and that was a person trying to pass off counterfeited $100 bills at a, at a um, like a gas station or something along those lines. So, so I, I did have a, a, a follow-up uh, question on that as far as in determining what uh, property value tier uh, would apply. And, and this is a question for you that, you know, if an individual has, has produced $10,000 worth of $100 bills, but he's only caught using one $100 bill at the local grocery store, but you know you find that there's another $9,900 in his wallet, how would that be figured out for, for the tiers? And, 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 and so there's a follow-up kind of question for this, which is do the tiers really fit in this, for this particular crime? Because uh, this, is, this is another one of those crimes that doesn't have a, a, a dollar value associated with what level of punishment under current law. Uh, and we're proposing a change to that. But I'm wondering, you know, as we've looked at this a little bit more deeply, whether that really fits. It's, it is an interesting question because uh, there are, as you've noted, a number of crimes that really are kind of adjacent to the structure that, you know, that are the kind of underlying logic behind what the sentencing commission put forward and you know another few examples are you know those some are some of the later sections of retail theft where you're possessing altered UPC labels or you're possessing tools um, like uh, that would try and shield from the kind of magnetic theft detector um, so there's a lot of potential for for uh, property theft but none has actually occurred uh, in the case of just possessing counterfeit bills. And so maybe for that crime, um, I know that, you know, this wasn't part of the kind of um, 
recommendation from the Sentencing Commission, it's certainly not an H87, but maybe thinking about splitting up the counterfeiting crime, maybe into an A and a B. And, uh, you know, A could be the mere possession and you could keep, you know, the whatever the kind of going rate or whatever the statutory penalty for that is uh, just kind of a, as part of the non-withstanding language and just set the, the mere possession of counterfeited money to tag it to a specific tier. And then, you know, if someone's actually trying to, you know, if someone's trying to pass a hundred dollar bill, then, th then that could be dealt with through the kind of tiered structure. Um, if anyone's trying to actually use a hundred dollar bill, a counterfeited or counterfeited money to use that value as the, um, as the penalty. Right. Which, which uh, to make this particular yeah, I guess I, I think of the situation if an individual only has one $100 bill um, and is passing that off, that under the current law could be subject to a 14-year felony just doesn't make sense to me, uh, frankly. But if, yeah, if somebody has been using it, using counterfeit money for a while, that, that's a whole other issue. Um, per personally, I think that this one needs probably a lot more thought and in, in, in additional uh, testimony as well, because I, I, there's, I, I'm still trying to really figure out the individual who still might have $900 or have $10,000 in, in bills. And, and if they never use it, really, what should be the penalty if, if there's not really been, I mean, is the, is the, the offense just the producing these bills? I mean, if they're not being used, then I don't understand what the, what the harm is. Uh, you know, I mean, I know there's harm in having counterfeit money out there. And, and then there's a situation where somebody is just using $100. I mean, they're actually using it, but they seem to be more blameworthy or culpable or whatever than the person who has $10,000 and hasn't used it and doesn't intend to use it. I'm only throwing these out here because there are complications. And, and I, I think at this stage, just for this point, because we wanna definitely have this in, in I think we, we need to be complete as far as these property crimes, is it would be good to find out what the going rate is for counterfeiting paper money and just stick with like a class uh, either class E or class D felony at this point, and then kind of uh, put a pin in it, so to speak, and come back to it to see if we need to go a little bit deeper. I don't know, what do you think, Maxine? I, yeah, I think that's fine to just kind of bookmark it. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I don't think, I really don't think that the tiered system works. I think it needs, you know, for it to, to adjust to the property value, I think it's going to take a little bit more time. Do you think this does violence to the whole uh, recommendation of the Sentencing Commission, uh, Pepper, or uh, does it sound like a reasonable? No, it, it, it is reasonable. I mean, you see it in, in other areas where you're, you're not looking at the actual property value of the damage done, the, 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 you know, the breaking of the, the dam you know, it's impossible to calculate what kind of damage is done. So you're just tagging um, the crime to a specific tier. Uh, and remember that that tier only provides a maximum. There's, you know, at sentencing, uh, you know, all of these crimes, by the way, uh, are subject to deferred sentencing. So, a, a, you know, a court could look at the person that has, you know, $500 counterfeit bills, but never really intended to use them or there was no indication and, you know, offer that person a deferred sentence that would ultimately lead to a dismissal of the charges. Right. All right. So we'll, we'll need to find, I guess we need to find out the going rate for, for the, the embezzlement crimes we just talked about and the counterfeiting crimes. And, and I'll certainly make that as a recommendation or a proposed uh, amendment to this. Um, so that, that's all I had for Pepper. That, were there other questions that I'm forgetting? Can I stand up? Can oh, I stand up? Oh, uh, thanks. thanks, Maxine. It's been up for, for an hour and a half. But anyway, um, <clears throat> go, go 
Um, wouldn't the word intent be in there? Um, let me, I have the- You know, if you got, if you spent a hundred dollars and you got whatever Martin said, 9,900 or something like that, which all I can think is beer on the wall. Well, it does say you have to have, you have to make, alter, forge, or counterfeit with the intent to injure or defraud a person. So there is an intent element, but it's hard, you know, why else would you be making counterfeit money except with the intent to you defraud? I don't know. I'm trying to understand this whole judicial system, but it's like, it's like, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with what you're saying on that, but how do you prosecute if you haven't actually used it? Maybe you're just using it for a monopoly. And I'm not even trying to be funny. Well, I can tell you that the, the most recent cases that I've seen on this are when people are actually using them. And that's, that's, the, that's the area where I think most of the litigation on this comes from. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I would assume that it would be difficult to, uh, to tie the intent to defraud to the making or the altering of the currency as opposed to the use. But um, yeah, so, so, but I think just for the interim uh, uh, that it, I think it fits better to have just either, you know, either a class, I mean, it would probably be a felony because we're talking about a 14 year felony under current law, but take a look at the going rate and try to match that up to, a, to one of the classes that we have. Uh, or categories of felony that we have, uh, it would be my suggestion. And, and we can find out from Robin, she could probably quickly, and maybe even already knows what the going rate is for that one. Yeah, so, I did it while you guys were talking. I knew you would, I knew you would. <laughs> um, so were there any other questions for James Pepper? Kate has her hand oh, I'm up. Sorry, I see Kate has your hand up. Yeah, thanks, good to see you Pepper. Um, so I'm just curious, it's clear that a lot of work um, went into these tiered systems and in the like vast majority of them, the um, length of potential time served goes significantly down. But I'm um, there's a lot of them where the fines go up pretty significantly. Um, and I, you know, I'm sort of like circling on my own paper a number of those areas. Um, credit card fraud, $50 or more, just a loan was $1,000, it would be $2,500. There's somewhere it goes from $2,000 fine to a $10,000 fine, theoretically. Um, anyway, I'm just, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that structure, the fine structure, and also, um, if you're the right person to ask, I guess I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the potential um outcome that could arise for someone if they were unable to pay a fine or um how that might impact them in their process we took testimony yesterday um you know from the department that handles restitution and talked about that they were sort of at the end of the line in terms of collecting money from folks and so like if fines are higher does that impact them and their ability to to you know handle restitution i just have a lot of questions sort of about the, the fine component of this yeah and, and it's i'm really glad that you picked up on that um because uh there are um some very significant fine increases as a part of this bill um so and that's really a reflection of the fact that when the Sentencing Commission set out initially to do its work in classification, um, you know, it created this tiered system um, based on the statutory imp imprisonment rate, the, the kind of the the um, the incarceration um, maximum penalty, and you know, it created uh, categories tiers, class A through E for felonies and, and A through E for misdemeanors. And then it moved on to fines. And uh, what they did uh, was they create, they tagged a specific fine amount to each of those categories. Um, you know, starting with the most uh, serious fine that we have, which is a million dollars, and then just kind of 
picked round numbers, you know, cut it in half for class B, 500,000 and 250,000 and then 100,000, um, you know, as they went down the list. I know um, the, I know that that's not what you're seeing in H87 because those fines were actually reduced um, in H87. But um, a lot of that work was kind of done in a vacuum at the outset of the Sentencing Commission's work. Um, and we, the Sentencing Commission voted on that classification structure and approved it and then um, sent it over to the legislature as a recommendation. And then when they moved to the second part of their work, um, which was actually inserting crimes into um, these uh, tiers, uh, the Sentencing Commission noticed, just like you did, that, well, like some of these fines are increasing significantly, you know, moving from, because the fines are really, you know, they're, they were created um, when the crime was created, a, a fine was assigned, and it may have not, never been looked at again. Um, but, you know, just by way of an example, the larceny from a person, 10-year felony, how, maximum potential of a 10-year sentence and the fine is $500. So if you put that into the tiered structure, um, you know, it would probably be, you know, class C felony, uh, which would be 10 years, but then the fine, the potential fine there could be up to $50,000, or I guess if you look at the H87, maybe 25,000. Um, so the Sentencing Commission actually in its 2019 report to the legislature recommended rescinding the fine structure because of this very problem that we identified kind of after the fact, once we started doing more work. Um, but to your second point, there's a lot, um, there's a few important things to consider when looking at fines. Um, one is fines um, can, eliminating fines altogether or increasing them for that matter um, can affect a person's right to access a public defender. And so it's just, I, I don't know the exact um, statute that, that says who's eligible for a public defender or not. And so maybe you would wanna hear from the public defender, but it is something that um, was raised at the sentencing commission that, that trying to fundamentally alter the fine structure could affect who's eligible and who's not eligible for a public defender. So that's one thing just to keep in mind when you're working on the fine structure. And then the second thing, which is also important, is that fines are very rarely used in Vermont. Um, and they're, they're also, uh, the court has the ability to adjust a fine um, based on someone's income or ability to pay. So uh, you, we don't have debtor's prison. For it. So a court is not gonna uh, impose a fine on a person that simply just cannot afford a fine. And, um, it's important to note also that I think the Defender General's office, um, you know, there's income eligibility for public defenders. And I think, you know, Matt uh, Valerio's office usually, I think handles so somewhere between 85 and 95% of all criminal defendants. And so most people in the criminal justice system, unfortunately do not have the ability to pay fines. And so fines are very rarely imposed. And this is a good segue to Robin Joy, because she, um, at one of our sentencing commission meetings, uh, was just looking at the fine data, and I could leave it to her to pick up right here, but I think um, the, the statistic that she gave us, and I, and I might be a little off here, but she looked over the last, she picked a random crime and looked at uh, the fines that were imposed for that crime over the past 10 years, and so she, she looked at grand larceny over $900. That, that's a possible fine of $5,000. And I think she said that in, in the past 10 years, a fine was only imposed in, in five instances and that the highest fine of those five instances was, was $500. So that just gives, you know, and she picked a random crime out of the books. Um, so uh, it just gives you some insight into the use of fines. So I think that the fine structure in this bill, while it seems very high, and, I, and, I, and certainly the state's attorneys would support decreasing the fines here. Um, you know, it's, no, it's not going to be truly reflective of the fines that would actually be imposed. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question, and I'm sure that Robin, who's been listening in, can give you more on the fines. 
It, it does. Thanks. And, and I guess just before um, Robin jumps in, I just, you know, it seemed like so much of the intent or an aspect of the intent behind this, people kept using the phrase like truth and sentencing and sort of this work that was done looking at how, what sentences are actually applied to certain crimes. And so it just seems, it would seem maybe a little confusing to me to do all that work and then have the fine structure not be at all reflective of what is actually occurring in the court. So I guess just wanna make that comment. Right, that's absolutely right. And um, the Sentencing Commission has committed to establishing a different fine structure but it's very difficult uh, to find one that can cons that would be consistent and also lower fines across the board, um, just because they vary so wildly uh, based upon when the bill was enacted or last amended, and um, you know the fines our current fine structure just seems to have very little rhyme or reason to it, um, and so we the sentencing commission was having a difficult time figuring out you know to create a tiered system that made sense that didn't lead to increases uh, in at least certain fines. Thank you. Uh, um, so yeah. has been. <laughs> uh, more of a comment than a question, but just uh, I'll just note that I last year we were last biennium, we the House passed a bill that would have um, made it possible for anyone charged with a crime to um, obtain the services of a public defender and sort of got rid of some of those thresholds. And um, maybe that's something we should be looking at again as we think about this, because I would hate to think of us, you know, needing to hold on to penalties or fines simply so someone could obtain representation. So I do have a question of uh, who else um, on the Sentencing Commission is working on the fine issue and whether we should hear a little bit more uh, from whoever else is actually on the subcommittee working on the fines. So that um, is subcommittee C, the, ch the chair of that is Judge Treadwell. So I wonder if we should maybe ask Judge Treadwell to perhaps come in and weigh in on the fines so we can try to figure out something that's satisfactory going forward. Because yeah, I mean, it's really interesting that the fines are holding this up because like uh, Pepper said, the fine, they're not being imposed that often. My bigger issue is that uh, restitution money should be coming before uh, somebody has to pay fines, frankly. Uh, but there is, I mean, and, and I guess, but there is a need to, to have some consistency in the fines uh, because they are all over the place. And, and it's, it's because they, I guess, I, and I've seen how, you know, perhaps we're doing the same thing now as well, because uh, in the last six years, I've seen some, I've had some opportunities to, to figure out what the fine would be. And it's, it's just kind of picking things out of the air somewhat, although Although I think recently we do kind of look at other crimes that are comparable and try to mirror what the other crimes are. But that's kind of what this is attempting to do at least. I don't mean to defend precisely the numbers that we have here, but that, that's the, the reason for this is that the fines for again, similar behavior, uh, we, we are matching up perhaps what uh, the incarceration should be, uh, and should we perhaps be matching up what the potential fine is, but the potential fine has, well, there's a lot of things one looks at for determining exactly what the incarceration should be, such as past history and other things, but, but there, you certainly need to look for setting a fine. The court looks to what the individual can, you know, what their financial situation is. Are they going to be able to pay the fine, like Pepper said? So, any event, I'm rambling on. I'm trying. I'm. I'm not just exactly sure the best way forward on that one issue. Uh, last year, I think we largely punted because we were going to be revisiting when we got a new recommendation, uh, and maybe that's not the best way. But we'll have to chat about that further and maybe get some input from Treadwell. And I know we don't have that much time, but I'm hoping we can at least get a few more minutes with uh, uh, with Robin for her to kind of briefly explain. Uh, the documents that she emailed. And, and, uh, and if Evan can 
actually email, email the, the documents, forward it to the House Judiciary, to the whole committee. Uh, I think that would probably be helpful. Uh, but uh, Evan, are you uh, able to kind of uh, to put the kind of run through? I think there was, were there three or four? Uh, there's three documents, if I'm recalling, right? And if we could, uh, I don't think we need to look at the, you can just pick whichever one you want. Let's, well, let's start with the toughest one first. Let's start with restitution, because I have probably the most questions on the restitution one. Um, and actually, sure. Robin, you probably have seen some of my questions. I emailed you some of the questions before. And yes, uh, so for the record, Robin Joy from Crime Research Group. Um, so let me just give you, an, um, let me give everyone a background of where these data come from. Um, I get an extract from the courts uh, every month of cases that have been filed and cases that have been disposed. And so when you ask me about sentences and things that happen after the filing, this comes from a file of things that are disposed. And when a case is disposed, um, I'll get the sentencing information, the fine information, um, a bunch of other information, including perhaps on whether restitution was was ordered. And I say perhaps because as I was trying to um, look at your questions, and if we look at uh, the restitution for property crimes, so just without boring you with a lot of computer stuff, um, this field is a free text field. So courts, uh, clerks write in 499 to Jiffy Lube and restitution. It's not a very easily searchable field, except for when they write none. Um, so that's why you're getting um, those with no restitution, because there was a clear capital N, capital O, none. Um, that said, I think, so these data show that restitution is not being ordered in a lot of property crime cases. And so this, since you have been talking about it, we, uh, you know, um, I kind of looked into the data that I get. And it may be um, because the way the statute is written, I'll defer to Pepper or the judiciary or anyone other than me, really. The way the statute is written, it says that if defense and prosecution don't agree on the amount of restitution, then it will be set for a hearing after sentencing. And I don't get that hearing after sentencing. Okay. Yeah, so I, I may not be the most accurate place to get the information. Um, th when I go through the free text field in some of them, um, so just because I have this data at my fingertips, um, I was looking up that timber, the timber crime, and um, there were eight charges filed in the last five years of that timber violation, and none of them had restitution except that one said – um, essay to file in 30 days. So that would mean that the state's attorney would file something uh, for a hearing in 30 days for restitution. Uh, and so I am not getting that restitution value, I think is what's an accurate statement. So, so this, this document is uh, just showing from the initial order disposing of a case, um, whether, the, whether that indicates there's restitution. Because I was yeah. a little startled by the I mean, it's, it, it makes it look like there's hardly any restitution, which kind of was con counter to what we heard from Chris Benno on Tuesday, where they have 80, 80, 80 some hundred, you know, 8,000 <laughs> going cases of restitution, and these numbers just didn't add up. But now it's starting to make sense. And yeah, there's also, um, when we looked at the restitution in the past in a different study, we found that the most, the most expensive crime was actually arson and DUI with, with uh, property damage. Right. Yeah, I so guess, that. I guess that, that what my concern was, was not so much how it impacts H87, frankly, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, restitution is somewhat similar, but it's certainly something that's come up that uh, uh, Representative Ghostland and others are concerned with, as am I. Uh, but to really understand the extent of restitution, we did get some testimony from Chris Benno, and perhaps we should, on the issue of restitution at some point, really hear from uh, Judge Grierson or some judges to really understand, because 
we want to make sure that restitution is being ordered and we just need to understand it more. I just don't think it's makes a difference really with H87, frankly. So I wonder if we could go to the other, uh, one of the other documents, Evan. Sure. And if you could explain what we're seeing. Uh, are you are you seeing what we're putting on the screen no. or do you need to explain no. what, which one we no, put you only get to, you, Yeah, you only get to hear my voice or I get to see you, I can't do both. Okay. All right, that one's fine. Let's see what that one is. Uh, and then I'll explain which one we're looking at. Uh, this one's called the crime, property crime diversion. Sure. So this is an answer to the question of how many property crimes are, uh, being, revert, are being referred to diversion. And so what I did is I looked at how many dockets with a, an offense of these property crimes were referred to diversion during these years. So I write on the line how to, you know, under the explanation how to read this chart. Um, and so for bad checks in 2015, 14 unique dockets that had a bad check charge were referred to diversion. So of course a docket can have many charges um, it can have uh, many charges of the same. So I could be charged with five bad checks, in which case I would be five of those 14 people here. Oh, no, sorry, I would be one of those 14 people. Um, can, one second. Uh, could you go to the top of that document, uh, Evan? I think that's the one that, yeah, uh, wait, I'm looking for bad checks. Bad checks should be the first one under, we're doing diversion, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're looking at that. Okay, so yep, in um, 2014, sorry, in 2015, 14 dockets with bad checks went to diversion. So you can kind of say those are 14 people. Um, that said, one of those people may also be in um, the embezzlement, right, or in a, in a credit card fraud. So a case can have many charges. I was just trying to get a sense of how many dockets were going to diversion. Um, and so this will tell you that, you know, this is how many dockets, not a lot, um, until you get down to retail theft, in which case you'll see there's about, you know, 200 dockets a year going to retail, um, going to diversion. But this was a question that came up a few weeks ago. Okay. All right. So any questions for Robin on this particular document and, and it just kind of give you some background so folks can take a look at it at their leisure after Evan sends it out to us. Why don't we go to the last one and, and have an explanation of that one. And uh, that one is the property values uh, document. Uh, yeah, so this is actually a spreadsheet with a few tabs. These data come from a different source. They come from the National Incident-Based Reporting System. And um, so that's the police data, some of it. And what this is, it was a way to kind of really get at the specifics of crimes and how they happen. So um, I gave, this was to get at the question of how many, um, how many charges were falling in between the 1,000 to 3,000 range. Um, right, so the way that your statutes are written, we just know whether it's over 900 or less than 900. We don't know the exact dollar amount. We look to the NIBRS data to help us understand what the values may be. Um, and so this is the one that did not translate very well at all to, uh, to um, PDF. Um, but the, the way that police data look at the property and the way that prosecutors would charge it has to do with um, pieces of property, not necessarily offenses. So um, in one of these charts that I have at the bottom, how to read the, the um, how to read it. And it's, so you would say that there were 3, 37,925 pieces of property involved in shoplifting that were valued up to $1,000. So that could be me stealing 3,000, uh, 30, sorry, 30,000 or so Snickers bars, right? Each time I steal a Snickers bar, I'm gonna show up here once um, for every Snickers bar I steal. And I just wanna make sure that people understand that one. Yep. Okay, good. 
Um, so the first on this uh, spreadsheet, you know, gives you the name and then shows you how many pieces of property were involved that were up to uh, up to a thousand dollars, one thousand, two thousand, et cetera, all the way up to the amount that the police recorded. Um, and so it was quite a lot of offense by property value. And then I just gave you a total number of um, pieces of property and value, regardless of the crime. So you could just see. Um, so there were 216,776 pieces of property valued at less than $1,000 um, for these crimes that I looked at in 2015 to 2019. These were only crimes that would be classified as property um, and the same you know, group of crimes that you saw. Um, I just was showing you a little different way to look at it. And then the last one, property type, yep. Yeah, I see that, yep. This is the okay. second, that, that was the second uh, document there, okay. Yep, and the last document on this one would, would start with aircraft at the top and it'll tell you whether it was recovered, stolen, um, and I don't know what aircraft you can steal for under a thousand, but somebody did it, I guess. <laughs> I'm thinking about the little, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe if that's how they would classify the, um, you know, the, the, the little um, planes that the kids play with, you know. Um, obviously not a kid person there. I don't know what the name of those things are. Um, but So uh, these are all the types of, of and, I, and I did this also just to show you the types of equipment that, or the types of property that we have space for in the data system to, to, see, to, um, to store. So you'll see, you know, there were crops and how many were burned or destroyed or vandalized, how many were recovered or how many reported stolen. Um, and it gets down to all sorts of types of equipment. Um, so you can see the value of property as it relates to the type that it was and the type of damage it may have um, sustained. Uh, so whether it's just damaged or stolen or seized or recovered. Um, and it goes all the way down. All the way down, okay. Yeah, so again, most of what, what happens here is under $1,000 according to the police data. Um, when you look at the first one again, uh, the, the, where I list the types of crimes, all other larceny, you'll see you know, how much would jump um, between, you know, and that things, it's about 3,000 and then things start to, to, to slow down a bit, 4,000 depending on the crime. And then Less and less as, uh, of the more expensive. So, so let me, so just in, I'm looking at the first page of this or the first spreadsheet on this document. And I guess I really can't tell, I, I initially had looked and I thought, all right, well, larceny, all other larceny, I'm just looking at the top one, says 68,138, our items are under $1,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 4,107 are, are between 1,000 and 2,000, 1,348 between two and 3,000. Yep. So, Correct. but if, if the particular crime only involved one of those items in yep. the 1,000 to $3,000 range, uh, you know, and that would, let's just make that assumption that would be around 5,500 thereabouts. Uh, that would be 5,500, again, if, each of those items were associated with, you know, just one item for each offense. That could be 5,500 offenses that would have been potentially chargeable as a uh, as a misdemeanor under this H87, but were chargeable as a felony uh, under current law. Is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Of course, we yeah. can't really quite do it that way because. We don't know how many items are associated with a particular offense, which could be pushing it over three thousand, or it could be pushing the mini, uh, the you know, the sixty-eight thousand one hundred thirty-eight items valued at under a thousand. If yeah. they had a, a, a few of those to push them over the nine hundred dollar rate, but under the three thousand, that those are additional offenses that could be a misdemeanor under this bill, uh, which would otherwise be a felony. But it really doesn't, we can't really exactly tell the impact as far as the number of offenses that would be charged right now as a felony. 
That yeah, and the historical data, I mean, I, you know, we could get you an average of the incidents, um, and I think I did that at one point, but yeah. that's just historical. Um, it doesn't predict, you know, future performances that this is how, um, and if you think, for example, of things that have skyrocketed in price during covid um, those, those, that skyrocketing of price and inflation isn't actually, isn't factored into these data. Um, right, right, right. Gotcha. Yeah. No, yeah. Another complication of this as well. All right. But yeah. it kind of just gives a little bit of an, uh, of a look that, um, but it doesn't give us necessarily the definitive answer as far as what right. impact is this really going to, uh, ultimately have. Um, were there other questions for, uh, Robin? At this and point. I did and just I want to go the, over the website. Yeah, I did. Um, yeah, over the, I think, I think actually we probably uh, are going to have to postpone that. I, uh, okay. So we, we can go off the shared document because I think that we still have a couple things that we need to do before 345. So we don't have a whole lot of time, I believe. I don't see Maxine because I'm, I'm still there's yeah there you are. Um, I guess the one other question before you go is if you yep. could, if you if you could tell us what the going rate was that you identified yep. on color. And I did send that to both you and Evan. Um, yeah, if you sent it, that's well, no, that's fine. If you could tell us what that is, because that should. Yeah, I'll tell you what it is. Let me just get it up. All right, so for counterfeit counterfeiting. Um, I had from, this is again, the court data, and this is from 2015 through 2019. Um, we had 10 charges that were deferred uh, with an average of uh, deferred for 3.8 years. Two charges that led to a sentence of incarceration um, with a max of 1.5 years and an average fine of $100. Uh, one charge that was sentenced to probation for um, about nine months. Um, deferred, uh, sorry, counterfeiting, passing, a good, uh, passing or, you know, passing, trying to pass off the uh, uh, bill. One charge uh, was sent, it was deferred for 3.5 years with no fine. And two charges were sentenced to incarceration for about 30 to 90 days. Um, with no fine. So that was counterfeiting. Yeah. For embezzlement, we had a lot. Um, so I gave you in this the chart, the, uh, the statute number, um, and uh, the average sentence it looks like for those who are sentenced to incarceration is generally about a year. Um, those who were sentenced to split sentences are um, a high of four years. Um, there were three charges sentenced to four years. And um, for days to serve on a split, right, so the split sentence is partially probationary and partially inside. Um, in the embezzlement official capacity, the split sentence there, there were four charges with an average of 400 days to serve. Um, there were only two categories that had fines, and the fine in one in five cases averaged out to be two hundred and ten dollars, and in another case um, at, was actually one hundred dollars. That was the only punishment imposed for embezzlement of more than one hundred dollars, and the crime was one hundred. The fine was one hundred dollars for one charge. And to the representative who was asking about the fine structure. Um, the first time I was here this session, um, we submitted a document called the Act 61 Reclassification Committee, and this was the vacuum before the Sentencing Commission that Pepper referred to. And in that report, um, you'll see the states that we looked at and some of the rationale. And if I recall correctly, the $1 million cap was there because it already existed in state law. And there was an idea of how do you punish corporations who commit crimes where sentencing them to jail is probably not what you want to do and you want to get the rest, you know, to get the, the fines instead. Um, but there is, a, there is on pages three and four of that um, an explanation of what states we looked at and how those fines, the original fine structures, which are no longer in existence, uh, were, were how we started that. Okay. All right. I appreciate that.
Um, yep. We'll certainly let you know if there's more questions. And thank you for sitting in on the on the conversation this afternoon. And Evan, if you could actually post those to the web, that would be helpful as well. So any other questions before Robin gets to head to greener or whiter pastures? I'm going to watch the Mars landing, man. That's what I'm doing. Oh, well, there you go. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Robin. Wow. Thanks. It's cool. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm going to have to ponder and maybe talk to some folks here as far as how to proceed or, you know, um, I am concerned. Yeah, I, I've been concerned about the fines issue is a pro probably the biggest one, but I also want to keep this thing moving, but I'm going to have to figure something out. Yeah, so... If um, cause we're going to do scheduling soon. If you could, yeah, think about what more testimony you need, you know, and so we could set it up for, you know, this coming week. And then, um, yeah, I don't really see this moving out of committee until after town meeting, you know, yeah, right I, 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 yeah, yeah. If, if then, I mean, I'm, yeah. I don't want to rush this either. And as we've gotten more deeper into it, it seems like we've taken a deeper dive than we really had the opportunity to last year. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually glad, glad at that because you know some of these issues are coming out that we really didn't see last year. Uh, I mean, we saw the we saw the fine issue certainly, but in any event, yeah. So I will ponder and and uh, make a proposal as far as how to proceed with this one. Okay. All right. Okay, Barbara. So, I just let's just keep going since we only have a. Oh, Tom's hand is up. Sorry. Yeah, just uh, doesn't even need an answer, Martin. But I, I can't I can't find my my way out of the woods from what, what we were talking about earlier with the uh, you know the restitution as far as uh, say if uh, timber was taken and uh, I didn't. I didn't know what a procedure would be. I mean, when you go, when there's a logging operation, uh, there's parts of the woods that are just devastated, you know, when you're running dozers and, and uh, um, things like skitters back and forth and, um, you know, uh, you know, the tops of the trees just laying there now and that type of thing. And uh, we were talking about restitution and kind of what was on my mind then was just uh, reimbursement for the, uh, for the lumber, but there would be potentially thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of damage to the to the woods themselves. That and I didn't know how that would be uh, handled in a court. So, so I think I think the restitution issue is important, but it's not. I don't think the only the, the only extent to which it's critical or important to H eighty seven at least is the higher the fines are that are actually being imposed, the less capacity for the defendant to be able to pay for restitution, presumably. Oh, no, I, I realize right. that. Yeah. Right, and, and so that's, I think, really the only connection with H87 because it's not about restitution. I mean, we don't have anything about restitution in this, uh, in this bill. Uh, that's, that's in a separate provision that covers restitution. And, and, and I think it's one that we need to keep on exploring. The reason why I'm glad it kind of came up and we saw that information from uh, Robin Joy that really concerned me because I've always been under the understanding that restitution is one of the primary penalties that our courts are really imposing this. It's not even really a penalty. It's oh. just you need to make the situation whole. And that's, I think, you know, the best, <laughs> that, that's kind of what we're trying to do with restorative justice as well, is restitution, not just monetarily, but just generally. But I'm not going to get... Right, yeah, with the expense that much to do with the H87, but if we need to look at how are they valuing uh, resource damage, I, I'm, uh, that's certainly something I'm all for looking into, but I, I think that's a separate, somewhat of a separate matter. Right, and, and I think uh, with expungement is going to be, for some people, be an incentive to get their restitution done so they can, right. it, all, it all kinds of tie, a lot of it ties together, but yeah. All right, thank you. Agreed. Okay. 
Okay, great. So, um, so once again, thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Evan, for helping to reformat the uh, the letter. Uh, does everybody have it? Has it been sent out again or posted? I'm not sure where where I we're at. Now, I don't know if people got it yet. Um, it's very close to what Barbara did before. I think you did incorporate. Um, yeah, thank you, Selena. Um, incorporated the sort of the mission of that statement and then or the guiding principles and then Martin's language, substituted Martin's language. Um, Did it make its way around? I'm not seeing it. Is it in, in our documents? I sent it, I emailed it like- 3.32, I, I received it. Yeah, oh, I got did? the email. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> I didn't, but that's all right. Oh yeah, okay, I just got it. Okay. During that Wi-Fi, I mean that connectivity. So, so I, you know, I think in the past what we've done is we've um, we've done either you know a show of hands or voice vote. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a bill that we do a roll call or anything like that. Um, but certainly would like to have the committee support. Um, you know, other recommendations that uh, that we then submit to um, to the Appropriations Committee. Um, the deadline is what, tomorrow, right? Right, I, yeah. yeah. And I, when I was at Appropriations this afternoon, Chris Benno um, testified and uh, talked a lot about the structural issues and said that, they asked her if she had a proposal and she said she did, that she was gonna propose that a study committee be um, formed like was done before, but it was before I was on judiciary um, that came up with the last structure and it had um, legislators from house and Senate, basically the money and the judiciary committees and then the executive director of um, crime victim services um, because she was talking about the issues with sustainability and just some of the nuances of what their format is. So Mary Hooper said, did you present it to your committee of jurisdiction yet, judiciary? And she said she had not. And Mary asked if she was going to, and she said she was going to. And then they said, oh, and I guess, since Barbara's here, she it will note that you're presenting it. I doubt we'll get it by tomorrow, but I didn't know. We sort of reference it anyway. Um, yeah. So I- What part wanted, was the study committee on? On a, the structure for the office of the Center for Victim Services. Yeah, I guess we need to think about whether or not we want to study this and, and if it's even us to study as opposed to government operations. And um, right. I mean, I think it's, yeah, it goes back to the fees and paying for programs with fees. So I, but yeah. And, and them being considered a state aid. She went through what is required of them as a state agency, but what they don't get because they're not really a state agency. Yeah, yeah. And again, that does seem like I did wonder about government ops, but I had already asked enough questions, so I didn't ask. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a longer range, bigger conversation. I think it's a very important conversation, but. Anyway, I just felt the, do, uh, the need to report. <laughs> I know, I appreciate it, thank you. So, um, so we've had a long afternoon. I don't, um, folks, where, where are folks at in terms of having read the letter, if they feel like they're comfortable weighing in yet? Uh, if not, we could do it, you know, right after the floor or something, or if, uh, okay, I see Martin's thumb, thumbs up. Um, just trying to kind of take the pulse of where folks are at. Okay, I see Kate. I haven't read it. 
Okay. You sort of, I read yeah. the first draft and then dip in, just scan, scanned this draft quickly and all of the content of it looks good. There, I, there's probably some small, like just, you know, grammatical, like little minor edits that I would recommend if there's time, I could yeah. be happy okay. to just take yeah. a look at it through that. Thank you. Or though Will is the professional editor, <laughs> maybe we should make him do it. <laughs> I, I agree. Any, I agree, Selena. Make Will do it. All right. So then, why don't we? Um, so after the so tomorrow morning after the floor, we're doing um, one forty-five. Before we do that, why don't we uh, just quickly check in and and uh, see how folks are are doing with it? I mean, we Please. can get get it read tonight, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you can read it tonight, and then uh, again tomorrow morning, just ask for a. Uh, I'll ask for a show of hands or voice vote, whatever. Sure. But good work, Barbara. Oh well, and I appreciate everybody's thoughts and comments. That was very helpful. Great. So. That's super good work. I really appreciate all the other issues that you raised and just your thoroughness and really looking to all the stuff that relates to what we've been working on. Thanks. I yeah, it. You, made, you had made one comment, Barbara, something about uh, uh, going out of our lane or something. And uh, yeah. because it was a topic that isn't specifically ours, but, and I think Selena just kind of touched on it where it's, it's kind of nice to go out of your lane a little bit just to see how things tie together. Right. We don't want anyone crashing into our lane, you know? Well. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's adjourn, please. <laughs>